Um, we'll try and keep uh, the briefing brief today. So uh, in that spirit, I don't have anything to start with. So is there any, any questions? David? Uh, at this point, I don't have any new any announcements uh, for you. Um, obviously, you heard from Admiral Willard yesterday, who talked about the important security relationship uh, that we have with uh, our allies in Australia, and um, you know I do anticipate that that will be an important part of the conversations uh, that that President Obama will conduct with Prime Minister Gillard uh, in Australia um, on Wednesday. Not exactly tomorrow, but on Wednesday. Um, but I, d I don't have any, anything new for you about any announcements that may or may not be made there. Well, as, uh, as you certainly have heard um, the President talk about yesterday and, and Ben Rhodes and Admiral Willard and, uh, and others over the course of this weekend, um, strengthening our focus on the Asia Pacific region is a core part of the President's foreign policy agenda. Uh, that's true when it comes to creating jobs and the economic policies that we need to put in place to open up opportunities, open up markets in the Asia Pacific region for American businesses. Um, this is also true when it comes to security considerations. Um, you heard Admiral Willard talk about yesterday the, um, the, um, the robust presence the United States has uh, in the region. Uh, certainly he talked about in the South China Sea how that is uh, our presence there stabilizes that region and facilitates a great deal of commerce, more than $5 trillion uh, in commerce, of which more than a trillion dollars is actually related to uh, American commerce uh, and a side to the American economy. So it is clear that, the, um, that there are many important reasons for uh, the United States military to have a robust uh, role there. Uh, we are certainly interested in, in, um, in leveraging that role to strengthen our partnerships with our allies and friends in the region. Uh, and Australia is certainly um, among those. And uh, we'll certainly have a lot more to say about this uh, uh, when we get there. So, Jake? Um, at the Republican debate the other night, uh, several of the candidates talked about the philosophy of phasing out all foreign aid to zero and having allies in other countries basically earn the, f the billions uh, in foreign aid that the U.S. Uh, disperses each year. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if uh, the White House has any take on this. I know the Obama campaign uh, has scheduled a, a call to talk about it, but since this is not just a campaign issue, this is a, a foreign policy issue, mm -hmm. I was wondering if, if you guys have any thoughts. <clears throat> well, um, I, I can certainly say that the, that is not an approach that this administration has taken. Um, there are a number of, uh, of countries where we, uh, where the United States directly benefits from having a role in those countries, and that we can certainly help um, that, that the provision of uh, civilian assistance uh, is critical to the success uh, of promoting American interests and serving American in interests in countries around the world. Um, the first one that comes to mind is obviously Afghanistan. Um, but uh, you know, the, the other example that's been talked about is, is Israel. Uh, and it's certainly uh, one of the things that the President has done is strengthened our ties with that country uh, and provided uh, um, significant assistance uh, in the form of the Iron Dome project and others that are critical to Israel's security. Uh, so these are the kinds of, of, um, uh, of uh, this is, it, it's the President's view that this is an appropriate use of, of government resources, particularly when we're in the time when uh, the federal government has to tighten it, has to, we have to tighten our belts um, and we need to scrub the budget, go line by line to look for, for uh, opportunities where we can reduce uh, the budget and cut the budget. Um, but uh, it, we can't do it at the expense of ensuring that our interests are well represented and well promoted uh, all around the world. So does that mean that you think that that approach would, would be contrary to Americans, America's interests? 
Uh, I can say that it's an approach that's entirely different than the one that President Obama has pursued. That's as far as you're going to go? That's as far as I will go, but it sounds like there's a conference call that's being ghosted by people who may be willing to go farther. Yeah, Rob, like Bob West. <laughs> Ed. Josh, a couple of days ago, the president here, as he's promoting uh, U.S. exports, said that he thought that maybe America's gotten a little lazy over the last couple of decades in terms of promoting American business overseas. Now, Republican National Committee jumped on that. They don't mention that in other speeches. Obviously, the president, we've heard him say, you know, I'm betting on America. We're going to win the future. And he's clearly said other things like that. But what did he mean when he said he thinks we've gotten lazy? Sure. Uh, what the president was talking about was the president was making the case that um, it is time for the United States and our foreign policy to focus on the Asia Pacific region. That there is enormous potential here. That uh, particularly when you're seeing the instability in economic markets around the globe, uh, Europe is obviously the best example of that, um, that in order for us to strengthen our economy, that we need to be involved and actively engaged in competing in those markets that are growing the fastest. Uh, and those markets are in the Asia Pacific region. Um, the President does believe that if we have the opportunity to compete in those regions, that because we do have the, the best workforce in the world, that we have the smartest, most aggressive, most ambitious entrepreneurs and business owners in the world, that if we can create, on a, if we can compete on a level playing field, that there's an enormous economic opportunity for the United States of America in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and so the, that is why the president has made this a, 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 a focus of his foreign policy moving forward. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, it's the president's view that, that, um, that, that this, is, this region has not been the focus um, yeah, in recent history. And that's what the president was alluding to, that we are in a circumstance where we need to redouble uh, our efforts to be engaged in this region. Uh, this is certainly true economically, but also uh, important um, strategically as well. Uh, and that's, that, that's, that's the case that the President was making, and that's a case that he's prosecuted pretty aggressively here at APAC. One quick follow-up um, on uh, uh, jobs as well. Uh, pipeline is something um, he spoke <coughs> about with the Canadian Prime Minister. The Canadian Prime Minister said he's disappointed at the U.S. action, but he's still hopeful, optimistic that down the road this will get approved. Why, when you're aggressively saying we can't wait, we've got to move on jobs, why wait over another year? on a project that a lot of industry folks say will create a lot of jobs. Sure. Well, you know, Ed, when the President was asked about this a couple of weeks ago, he actually made a pretty persuasive case that we are not going to be in a position where we are going to sacrifice the public health and safety of our children uh, just to get a couple thousand jobs. Um, what the President believes is important is that we need to balance those competing interests. Uh, that we need to um, pursue opportunities to create jobs. There are a number of ways to do that. The President's laid out the American Jobs Act. Um, but there are a number of things that we can do to balance the interest in terms of creating jobs, but also protecting the health and welfare and safety of, of our children. Uh, and that, frankly, is the crux of the decision that, that was announced by the State Department last week, that there were concerns that had been raised by the, um, about the route uh, and about the impact that that could have on the environment. Uh, and so what the State Department has said is that they uh, want to explore other possible routes. Uh, I want to point out that this is actually um, a decision that was praised by the Republican governor of Nebraska. Um, he said, we're very excited here in Nebraska that our voices have been heard. Uh, and so I, I think it's important to, to note that, um, that even Republicans are, are praising the administration's efforts to try to balance those two competing interests in terms of creating jobs and protecting the health and welfare of sa and safety of communities uh, that are along that, along that route. Ann. Thanks, Josh. The President's always said he thought the individual mandate in health care reform is constitutional. Why is it so unpopular? Well, I think there are a number of reasons for that. Um, I think part of it is a uh, political calculation that's been made by the other side. Uh, as the President has pointed out and others have pointed out, uh, the personal responsibility provision of the Health Care Act is modeled after an idea that was conceived of by the Heritage Foundation. Uh, so there is a, a political calculation that was reached by the opponents of the Affordable Care Act uh, to pick this fight. Um, the fact of the matter is that the Affordable Care Act is already yielding significant benefits to the American people. We already see that there are uh, a million young people who are getting health care today um, because of the ability that they have now to be covered under their parents' uh, health insurance. Uh, plan. Uh, we, we see that uh, insurance companies are now prevented from discriminating against people because they have a pre-existing condition. 
Uh, we're now seeing that insurance companies are being held accountable for spending the vast majority of the premiums that people pay um, and actually spending that money not on bonuses and not on advertising, but actually on providing uh, 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 health care services to the people who are covered by their program. So, What about the individual mandate? That, that's the center of the controversy and the challenge. Mm -hmm. And Americans don't agree with them necessarily that it's the same thing as car insurance. <coughs> Well, I, I haven't looked at the at the specific polling. I, I think that the you know the, that there have been a number of rulings that have come out uh, at the district and at the um, uh, court of appeals level. Um, at the at the court, court of appeals level, um, we've actually seen that um, there have been a number of judges that were appointed by Republican presidents who have agreed that this is a constitutional provision. Uh, I don't think that's particularly surprising. Uh, it certainly wasn't a surprise to the people in this administration. But it is why we ha we are confident that it's something that's going to be upheld by the Supreme Court. And that as the benefits uh, of, the, um, of the Affordable Care Act continue to be implemented, that these benefits, that the benefits of, of things like the personal responsibility provision uh, will become clearer. Does he worry about the election year uh, timing of a decision from the court? He's not. He's not. Peter? Josh, uh, the court's decision to take this up is hardly a, a surprise, but uh, when did the president uh, find out about this? How was he advised? What, what kind of discussions has he had since? Uh, uh, word was received about it. Uh, it, it. You're right. It's not a surprise, and in fact, it's actually something that we had requested. We had we had formally asked the Supreme Court to consider this uh, issue. Uh, I, I can't speak to when the president found out about it. Um, it was announced early this morning, East Coast time. So uh, I assume that he found out this morning, but I'm not sure the mechanism. Did you know from whom? I'm not sure. Could you find out? Uh, we'll look into it. Yes. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks, Josh. Um, the president called the chairs of the super committee before he left. Has he reached out to them again and gotten another update on their progress? Uh, he has. He, I, I don't believe that he has. Um, I at least don't have any calls to read out uh, for you in addition to the ones that he made on Friday. Um, obviously, when the president called on Friday, he called to deliver a very clear message that the that that the super committee should not be engaged in an effort to try to look for ways to get out of the trigger, to to get out of uh, of of the uh, to to undo the. Um, the accountability that was put in place to ensure that the super committee and the Congress as a whole would act to do something serious about reducing our deficit. Uh, so the president's position on that is is very clear. In terms of our ongoing consultation with the with the super committee, um, I mean it's it's again it's clear where the president stands. He put out his own plan uh, back in September about what exactly the super, about what it exactly he thinks the super committee should should do to implement a balanced approach to reducing our deficit, to going above and beyond the $1.2 trillion mandate that they have, to do something serious and meaningful to bring down our long-term deficit. Um, and, you know, there are, if there are additional consultations that are needed at the staff level, that's certainly something that we're, we stand ready to, to, uh, to work with them on. But uh, at this point, it's the responsibility of the super committee to, um, as the president said yesterday, to bite the bullet, to make these difficult decisions, to what the American people expect, uh, there's certainly plenty of evidence to indicate that this would be in the best interest of our economy. Um, so the, the, the stakes are high. There's no doubt about it. This is what the super committee members signed up for. Uh, and we are, um, uh, you know, the, the president is, um, uh, is strongly encouraging them to, to, to make those difficult decisions. The administration has been adamant, though, that he is going to continue to stay on top of this even while he's away during this trip. Do you expect him to reach out in the coming days? Uh, I don't. I don't know. But if we have calls to read out to you, then we'll let you know. Okay, Ari. You and Ben talked about sort of the, the policy implications of the trip to Australia. But given that he's never been to the continent before, I wonder if you just talk about his thoughts about visiting the country for the first time. Sure. I, I haven't spoken to him about it specifically, but I can tell you that um, you know that obviously he has hosted the uh, the uh, Australian Prime Minister at the White House. He did that last year. Um, there have been a number of there have been a couple other times in which. Uh, the president had hoped to visit Australia over the course of, the, of his presidency. Uh, so he's pleased that he'll have the opportunity to do that now. Uh, he can certainly use, he certainly will use it as an opportunity to cement the important relationship that exists between the United States of America and, and Australia. Uh, there are important economic implications in terms of the relationship that we have and the commerce that's facilitated between our two countries. Uh, but he will also talk about the important strategic relationship uh, in terms of the security cooperation uh, that we have between the United States and Australia. Um, and it will be an important opportunity for him to, uh, to cement that relationship when he travels there later this week. Okay. Laura? Uh, just following up on that line of thought, is, does he have any regrets that he's going to be going to Australia and not seeing 
some of the best that Australia has to offer, such as Sydney or some of the other coastal cities that are world renowned? Sure. I, I, in some ways, this is uh, the double-edged sword of presidential travel, which is you get to go to amazing uh, places that that uh, you know that uh, that many Americans n don't have the opportunity to see. Uh, the other side of that uh, coin, though, is that uh, oftentimes you spend a lot of time inside the hotel ballrooms, uh, or in convention centers, or in meetings, uh, um, and don't get as much of an opportunity to to get out and see the sights. Um, but as I pointed out, the president is looking forward to the uh, to the opportunity that he'll have to um, you know to to. Uh, to, to talk about the, you know, the important issues on the agenda that, uh, that are in place. Um, and it, it should be a, a worthwhile visit. Is there any reason why um, he, you didn't schedule more of those sort of cultural type of visits in other places that he's gone? Like in Egypt, he visited the pyramids. And in Rio, he saw the Christ the Redeemer statue. I mean, he's, he has made an effort in other foreign travel to see some of the places that aren't maybe about, um, you know, important high-level issues but are important to the culture of that place. Sure. And is there any reason why he's not doing that sort of thing this time? Well, look, there's, there's no doubt that there's lots to see in Australia, and the President's going to see quite a bit when he's there. He's obviously going to uh, have these high-level meetings with the Prime Minister. He'll do a news conference. He's going to speak to a, speak to the Parliament when he's there. I know that there's an opportunity that he's looking forward to to visiting a school uh, when he's in Australia. Uh, this is something that he and the Prime Minister did when she visited uh, Washington last year. Uh, and then he, we're also going to fly to uh, to Darwin, uh, where the president will have the opportunity to address uh, some Australian troops out there. So there's a lot that we're going to pack into uh, this day and a half visit to Australia. Uh, but there's no doubt that um, if we were staying longer, there'd be more to see. Uh, the president today is uh, participating in a campaign event uh, that will be headlining here. Uh, in terms of his afternoon activities, uh, there's nothing on the schedule uh, as of yet that I'm here that I'm prepared to announce. Um, but Do you have any sense of how he'll be spending his time today? Uh, my guess is that he'll, be, he'll have the opportunity to, um, to spend the afternoon relaxing a little bit after a very busy three days here. Mike? Yeah, I wanted to get back to the Keystone decision. When the President was in Brazil last year, he told President Rousseff how eager the United States was to import oil from there. It seems with the Keystone decision, We've said to the Canadians that we're not interested in importing your oil, or at least not the tar sand oils. Uh, Canada and Mexico provide the U.S. the bulk of their imported oil. Is there any concern on the part of the President, particularly given uh, Prime Minister Harper's apparent comments about looking for Asian markets for their oil, that this controversy could jeopardize a major source of U.S. energy, of U.S. imported energy, I sure. should say? Uh, there is not. The reason for that is this. The, the decision that was reached by the State Department was to continue examining the proposed route of the Keystone Pipeline. Um, so this is, this is an opportunity that we're going to continue to pursue in terms of looking for a, a pipeline route that will effectively balance the competing interests that the President talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago in a television interview, which is the need to find a, uh, a route that will create jobs, that will give us an opportunity to um, get access to uh, oil from a friendly, reliable neighbor, uh, but also to do it in a way that, um, that reflects the imperative of protecting the health and welfare uh, of the communities along the pipeline. So these are competing interests. These are difficult decisions. Uh, and it's one that, uh, you know, that we, uh, you know, that hasn't been, that frankly, that hasn't been made yet. Then the siting issues with the pipeline itself. Does the president believe that this is an important source of energy for the United States? Um, well, I, I mean, I can I can tell you that this is sort of this is part of the State Department assessment, uh, and you know we certainly are. The president has laid out uh, a commitment to looking for ways that we can make ourselves independent uh, of foreign oil, particularly those energy sources that are derived from uh, the Middle East, which is you know plagued with some. Uh, uh, difficult political circumstances right now. Uh, so there are a number of things that the President has done on this front in terms of just last week uh, announcing some new domestic oil exploration initiatives, uh, opening up new opportunities for exploration here in the United States of America. Uh, he's implemented far-reaching fuel efficiency standards that would actually um, make the, our, our, our vehicles on our roads much more fuel efficient, uh, that would save consumers about a trillion dollars. Uh, and reduce uh, our, rel our reliance on oil 
uh, by about 12 billion barrels. So there are a number of things that the President has done uh, to try to, to, to confront this difficult problem, and that is even before uh, the uh, historic investments is that, that this administration has supported in renewable energy uh, and those kinds of things. So, yes. Is the President wearing a Hawaiian shirt today? <laughs> uh, I, your colleagues in the pool may have the opportunity to get that answer for you. <laughs> All right. Eric. Thanks, Josh. Um, I want to get back to the um, Prime Minister and the note on bilateral. Following up on the question I was asked previously. Um, after the statement was set up on the White House, the Japanese put out a statement saying that the Prime Minister's words were mischaracterized, that uh, not everything was on the table. Could you clarify what happened there? Was, was, was there a mistake made? And what kind of, does this cast any kind of shadow on possible entry to the uh, I, I appreciate the question. I'm not going to be in a position to stand here and, uh, and parse through or additionally read out our readout of this. Um, what I can tell you is that the uh, the readout that we put out was based on the private consultations that the President Obama and Prime Minister Noda had. It's based also on the public declarations from, from Prime Minister Noda and other members of his administration. Um, what is clear is that we welcome their interest uh, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, this is an opportunity for us uh, that, you know, principally through the President's leadership and his efforts in engaging in the Pacific region, that we have to try and raise uh, economic standards around the globe. Uh, that we can create new opportunities uh, in foreign markets for American small businesses and medium-sized businesses, that we can try to streamline a regulations regime uh, that will uh, make the process of doing business overseas more efficient and more standardized, uh, that by raising the bar and raising these standards, we can actually uh, spark some economic dynamism that will create expanded economic opportunity all around the world. Certainly, Prime Minister Noda and the leaders of the other countries that are involved in the Trans-Pacific Partnership are interested in creating jobs in their country. There's no doubt that the President believes that these kinds of opportunities would create jobs uh, in the U.S. Uh, and so we certainly welcome their, uh, the Prime Minister Noda's and, the, and, and Japan's interest uh, in, uh, in, in, in pursuing uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So the next step in this process is continued bilateral consultations with the other with the other countries who are already, have already signaled their interest in this. So that'll be the next step in this process, and we'll move forward, and we certainly welcome their interest. Exactly. After you passed the White House, did you guys to revise the statement officially or formally? Uh, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't know the answer to that. In the back. Yeah, thanks. Um, the President's statement about China growing up seems to have stunned quite a bit in Beijing. The foreign ministry spokesman said, uh, it's America, not China, that needs to abide by international trade rules, dismissing uh, to the president's suggestion that China is behaving immaturely unfavorably. I know you don't want to get into a tit for tat, but I mean, was, was that, you think that was expected in terms of response and in terms of what the president, after his uh, bilateral with President Bush? Uh, well, I can say that I think the president expressed himself pretty clearly yesterday at the news conference. Uh, and I don't think that I have anything to, to expand, up, expand upon that. Um, you know, obviously, you know, the reason that uh, that the President, I think President Obama has met with President Hu ten times uh, in bilateral conversations. Uh, so it is clear that, um, that President Obama and this administration have an interest in engaging uh, the, Chinese, the leadership of China, President Hu himself, and the people of China. Uh, but in addition to that engagement comes um, a set of responsibilities, and the President, I think, uh, articulated his view of those responsibilities pretty clearly yesterday. Okay. Toshi? Obama and uh, Prime Minister Nora. So your, your position is that the that readout is still accurate and you have no plan to modify it. And, uh, and also, is the White House confidence, confidence on Nora's determination to go through a diff difficult process shaken now because of this incident? Uh, no, we don't anticipate uh, revising the readout. Uh, and we continue to have confidence um, uh, in Prime Minister Nora's stated interest. Uh, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. As I, as I pointed out to Eric, you know, the next step in this process is continued bilateral consultation uh, at all levels, uh, and so we'll, that, we'll let that process uh, work its way through. Yes. yes. Right. Jack, I'll give you the last one. Um, could you address the uh, events in Syria and, and tell us what, if anything, the President's done to, uh, to keep up on that? Um, 
I can. I will, I will say that we, um, we obviously applaud the decision that was reached, or that was announced by the Arab League. Um, there is, it's clear that the Assad regime is continuing, uh, is continuing to be isolated, uh, that the political pressure on them is building. Uh, it is clear what the administration, that what the Obama administration's posture is on this, which is that President Assad has lost his legitimacy to rule and should go. Um, and certainly all of the violence uh, that has been perpetrated by the Assad regime against peaceful demonstrators uh, should cease immediately. Uh, the American people and increasingly the international community and, and now the Arab League with their declaration uh, is on the side of the Syrian people and their aspirations for a transition to democracy. Uh, in terms of the President's uh, involvement in the last 24 hours on this, I, I don't have anything for you on that. talk to the King of Jordan before his decision to also call on uh, Assad to step down? Um, uh, I, I don't have any details on that for you. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your uh, Hawaiian Monday. <laughs>